Hi everyone, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon. Thank you for joining today's Pure Insight. Today is July 30th, 2013, and the topic for today is enhancing cloud storage uh, with technologies such as uh, uh, hybrid storage, uh, a bunch of other technologies we're going to be covering. Our uh, end user guest today is Steve Newell, who's with a cloud services company named Bunami. Bunami is based in Utah. Um, Steve, thank you so much for joining us on the Pure Insight today. You bet, thanks for having me. Great. So, uh, Steve, uh, you know, before you get started, we're, we're going to talk uh, about how you uh, have, your company's been around, cloud services are kind of new, you recently went through a change in your storage infrastructure, and my understanding is you've also made some changes in your networking, and, and really, you know, overhauling kind of the, the substrate of your environment, and that's uh, created some new opportunities, uh, so some challenges that you went through uh, going in through your decision-making process, so, uh, you know, we want to kind of dig into that over the next hour. Um, so if, if we could start with, if you could tell us uh, a little bit about Vunami and your role there and kind of what led up to this recent uh, set of changes that you went into. Great, thank you. So Vunami, as you said, you know, we are a cloud services company. We're actually a full service data center. We have two data centers, one in the Salt Lake metro area and one south in the uh, Utah County area. We um, do everything from traditional co-location to uh, public, private clouds, hybrid clouds. Uh, we also do end user desktop support, you know, full service IT support. Uh, as you mentioned, um, recently we went through a, a change in our, in our um, infrastructure in order to um, meet the demands of our growing business. We needed to expand our, initially it was our storage offering. Uh, we were using um, a traditional SAN that we were very happy with but needed more capacity and uh, potentially more performance. And that's kind of what led us to the, um, to the, uh, you know, through the process of, of evaluating all the different storage options that are available now. And uh, we finally ended up on a Tegile um, storage system. Okay, so St Steve, can you walk us through a little bit about your profile? Uh, you said you've got two primary locations. What, what's your growth looking like? Uh, what was the size of your environment? And uh, you, you know, how old was the infrastructure that you had that you were then looking to upgrade? Yeah, so Vinami actually uh, started as a data center company in 2007. At that point, we purchased um, you know, uh, our storage systems then. We've upgraded them and maintained them. Um, as I said, we do have two locations. Uh, we have about 11,000 square feet in the Salt Lake data center and about 6,000 square feet here in the Orem data center. Uh, both of those are um, about 50% uh, capacity right now in terms of square footage. We, uh, you know, we have multiple uh, bandwidth carriers coming into both locations. We have uh, redundant connections between both of those, so both of those data centers can function as a you know, hot backup to, to the other. Um, with this, again, back on the storage, uh, our initial storage purchase was in, in 2007. We made a follow-up purchase in 2009 um, from the same vendor. Steve, this is Dave Vellante. Uh, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Dave? Good, thank you. So can you talk a little bit about um, how much storage, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of growth you're looking at and what some of the real challenges were that you were facing? Okay. Well, so, as I said, we were nearing capacity in our storage and began looking um, for alternatives. We um, stayed with the existing vendor and we're looking at that, but found that, um, you know, we were looking to, to add in the neighborhood of 20 terabytes or so um, to, uh, to our storage system, and that began to look a little cost prohibitive. Okay, so uh, we value some other some other vendors. Steve, can, can you just? Uh, my understanding is, you know, you you've had a real good experience with your previous vendor, the original vendor, and it's NetApp, correct? Yes, it is NetApp. Yeah. Okay, and it, you weren't looking to necessarily throw out the NetApp. There wasn't any gap in the functionality uh, of the product. It it was really uh, that kind of the price per gigabyte uh, that you were looking at and, and the growth that you had. And you also mentioned performance. Uh, you were having challenges there. Is that right? Yeah, in fact, we, um, we spent quite a bit of time with NetApp and their engineers uh, looking at additional solutions and, and things that we could do. And, and it actually did have a, a solution that, that would have met our needs. Uh, but again, it was, it 
was rather expensive. Um, and in order to get the performance we needed, we were going to have to add a lot more spindles to the to the shelves than what we had originally hoped, which you know obviously increased the price. So, uh, but, but we were you know very happy with NetApp and continue to have NetApp in our in our environment uh, and continue to use that that storage. Okay, um, and it was, it was a performance issue at, at the end of the day. Great. So, Steve, you, you went through a process with NetApp, and you looked at a lot of vendors. Can you, can you walk us through how you handled that process and, uh, you know, what you were finding as you looked out at a number of vendors? Right. So we, we spent, as I said, a lot of time with NetApp and explored various options. We looked at, um, you know, adding the, the flash in front, um, putting cash in there, um, mixing and matching the different types of drives, trying to get uh, a price performance point that, that we were comfortable with um, and at the end of the day we felt like we were just about there but but um, felt like we needed to spend a little bit of time and look at some of the some of the other vendors that were out there and so we you know we, we reviewed uh, four or five different vendors uh, at the last minute um, we were introduced to Tegile and looked at their their offering and found that we were able to get uh, the 20 plus terabytes that we're, we were hoping for, a significantly lower price per terabyte. The IOPS were nearly an order of magnitude more than what we were getting with with uh, the NetApp as we had it. Back. And um, one of the things that we really liked about Tegel is that many of the add-ons that we were paying for the protocols and uh, you know, the, the replication and the snapshotting uh, that were add-ons with NetApp were included with, with Tegel. And that was kind of the thing that kind of helped push us over the edge there. Okay, so so Steve, I definitely want to come back to you know so, some of these enhancements you saw, especially in inserting Flash. Can you talk about uh, kind of your your business drivers? I understand that really updating your infrastructure allowed you to make some changes and in, in some new offerings into what Absolutely. you had. Yeah. So in conjunction with uh, upgrading our storage, we also upgraded our compute, um, and so we were able to tie. And that new compute platform is a Cisco UCS platform, and we were able to integrate that with our new Tegile. Um, storage and really provide a very, very performant environment. Uh, it is our, um, primarily our cloud uh, is hosted on, on that environment. <clears throat> we were able to, to, with this new hardware, offer significantly more performance at, um, at comparable prices. So our prices really actually didn't go up to our end user. And in fact, in some cases, we were actually able to, to lower the price of, of some of our cloud offerings and yet give a, a, quite a bit more performance. Um, and that most of that performance came from the storage subsystem, although the compute also gives us a, a lot more. So, Steve, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your business. So you're competing in an infrastructure as a service marketplace. Uh, talk about how that's changed over the last let's say 12 to 24 months. I mean, you've seen uh, much more aggressive Amazon, you've seen uh, responses from a lot of the major system vendors, uh, you've seen this you know, flash and hybrid storage come into play, this whole software defined meme. Uh, talk a little bit about that business in general, how it's changed and how, how you guys compete and what your unique value is. Right, okay, well, so, you know, as I said, originally we were a, a straight colo play. Um, in the cloud environment about uh, three years ago, and we've seen a lot of changes. We're still seeing some changes. It's still, as the, um, you know, as our, as our customers are coming to us, most of the time they're coming to us as a colo or a shared server customer. And we're, we're still having to do a, a fair amount of sell to, to get them to move into the cloud. What we have found, though, is that once we get them into the cloud, all of those things that you talked about, the, you know, the software-defined networking, the the, um, you know, the hybrid storage, all those things just really make it a, a, a really good offering for them. We are finding a lot of competition. Many of our customers are coming to us, though, from an Amazon or from, from one of the other public clouds. And I think the thing that we offer that um, some of those larger players can't do is, is we actually do a lot of hands
hands-on with the customer. We're able to help them understand what it means to migrate to the cloud, um, what changes may need to be made to their infrastructure to get it to play in the cloud properly, uh, as you're aware. We hear you, Steve. Sorry, you still, you still with me? Yep, we're still with you. Yeah, okay. it's a little background noise from one of the participants, it sounds like, but right. keep going. Okay. One of the things that we found moving, moving applications to the cloud is that too often um, we think we can just move, move the app straight into the cloud and not make any changes, and, and often that's the case. But in order to take full advantage of all of the, the, uh, the power the cloud offers, sometimes we have to do a little bit of re-architecture or a little restructuring. And one of the things that I think Gunami offers is that uh, we are able to, to, to help the customer do that. We have a very strong software development background and a very strong IT background as well. And so we're able to help them understand and, and make those changes. So, so it's fair to say that you know, relative to the sort of the gorilla uh, of Amazon, you, you would compete largely on the basis of your service, your belly-to-belly -belly service, your white glove service, your ability to, to go in and build a relationship with the customer, do more hands-on stuff than, say, Amazon is willing to do or, or it and its partners can do. Is that fair? Absolutely, and I think we also compete very well in performance and, and, and price. So yeah, it's kind of the trifecta. So how, how, I mean, you're, you mentioned Tejah before using this hybrid storage um, array, presumably, or set of arrays. How has, how have flash economics changed the way in which you're able to deliver performance, you know, cost effectively to clients? Well, I think particularly in, in a hybrid storage solution, you know, we're able to take, take advantage of the flash, uh, even though it is still more expensive uh, per gigabyte, um, but because of the way Tejal and other, I assume, other um, hybrid storage makers have, have architected their offering, it appears to the end user as if it is a fully flash array, even though it's backed by the, the less expensive um, SAS drives. So, you know, two years ago, I don't think we would have even considered a flash storage array simply because the the economics just made it completely unfeasible. Uh, we didn't need quite that performance. It would have been nice, but we certainly couldn't afford a full, a full flash array. So uh, um, are you able to, what, what, talk about quality of service a little bit and how uh, you're able to say pin quality of service. Can I do that at a, at a you know, IOPS level? Uh, Bandwidth level. How how do you how does QoS play into your service delivery? Well, it's it's really honestly it's less of an issue now than it than it has been in the past. Simply because the the underlying storage system is so performant that we really don't need to spend as much time worrying about that as we have in the past. You know, our previous arrays we had a mixture of SAS and SATA, and so it was you know we we had a tiered storage offering and and spent a lot of time working with the customers making sure that they were in the right storage tier. With this new hybrid storage system, that's not an issue anymore. All of our all of our customers are on the the gold tier, if you will. Uh, they're all accessing the hybrid. The hardware actually deals with the, you know, offloading data out of the flash and onto the, the slower um, SAS drives and pulls it back on demand. So so we, we honestly have not had to spend uh, very much time at all worrying about QoS issues, at least with the storage. So that's been, a, that's been another win for us. So Steve, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that, that interrelation between virtualization and cloud. Um, most of your customers, you said, starting out in kind of co-location, are they using VMware today? If they look at going from uh, you know, just a colo to a hosted, from a hosted environment, I'm sorry, to your services, are, are they, Staying on VMware, you know, what's your relationship with VMware is, I guess, a good place to start. Okay, yeah, we are, our, our public cloud currently is hosted on VMware infrastructure. One of the things that, kind of the, the half step that we took to the cloud, uh, I think, as an industry was, you know, moving from physical servers to, to virtual servers. That next step, uh, in my mind, is the cloud.
cloud, which gives us a little bit more dynamic resources. So we are hosting um, the majority of our, of our public cloud on VMware um, and fronting it with vCloud Director, which gives our end users quite a bit of control over their virtual environment. So um, one of the things that does for us is it, it kind of eliminates the hands-on that we need to have gives the customer the ability to adjust their resources dynamically. And um, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, VMware has been a great technology. It integrates well with you know, all, of, all of our systems from, from storage and networking to the compute level. And um, gives us a great deal of control and, and gives the end user a lot of control over there. Okay. It's my understanding you're, you're also using network virtualization from VMware. Can you fill us in on some of what you're doing there? I'm sorry? Network virtualization from VMware? I still missed the first part. Steve, network virtualization, the NICERA stuff? Thank you. All I heard was Asian. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so we do a lot of software-defined networking. Uh, we, we really, really uh, have appreciated the, the flexibility that that gives us. So we're able to create virtual data centers for each of our customers and allow them to then manage their own edge gateways uh, in, the, in the VMware environment, giving them access to you know, their own firewall, their own um, VPNs if they need them. And the thing that I think most of our customers are really appreciating is the, you know, the, the, uh, the VDC networks and the ability to create private networks in their own environment that lets them isolate resources, um, and we're we're finding a lot of a lot of our customers are, are taking advantage of that, and also taking advantage of the, the load balancer that's built into the edge gateway. Okay, great. I, I want to take this uh, time to open it up to the audience. Sounds like we have quite a few people on the phone. I know David Floyer's uh, phoned in, so uh, let me pause for a second and see if we've got any questions from the community. Sure. Uh, if you can please at least let us know your first name and if you're comfortable, uh, you know, what company you're with or what your role is. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Dan B. Kraft. I'm a vice president here at Morgan Stanley, and I run one of our cloud computing portfolios. And uh, I study a lot about this whole industry uh, thanks to Wikibon and uh, just props out to Dave. But um, quick question for you on companies with the flash drive. So in my area here in Seattle, you know, I cover a lot of Amazon and Amazon's cloud computing services, and you know, our analyst department says it's kind of a threat to everyone in the industry because of their, you know, their ability to just spend money for something like a whole Fusion I/O storage facility. Uh, what is, how does that? And I noticed I listened to what you said about how you were looking for cost-effective solutions to provide that. Is that something you think that you may do in the future, where you may look at? Uh, maybe either a Fusion or maybe EMC or STEC or any of those. Do you see your business progressing in that direction or do you see more that you're going to use some of this SAS technology and hybrid a lot of it out? And I'll take your, I'll mute my phone and listen to your answers. Thanks. Well, you know, as we were doing our analysis, we actually looked at several of those vendors. We, we look very closely at EMC. Uh, we're very familiar with Fusion IO. Uh, and, and again, for us right now, the the uh, price performance was just not there. It wasn't worth it to us to go full flash. Um, that's not to say in the future we may not, but I don't know that, um, at least in the foreseeable future, that that's going to be required simply because of the performance we're getting from the hybrid array that we, we currently have. Uh, I don't know that we would get that much of an increase in performance uh, going to a full Fusion I.O. type system. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is uh, David Foyer. Um, I've got a question about the uh, type of workloads that your, uh, your clients are using your uh, service for. Could you talk a little bit more about what, they, what that types of applications they're using, uh, what uh, types of environments uh, that they're using your service for? Sure. I can't, I can't tell you a whole lot about some of them simply because as it is a, a cloud environment, we're not 
intimately involved with what's being run there. However, I do know that we have uh, a fair number of web farms. Uh, I know that we've got a fair number of Linux and Apache stacks with either Postgres or MySQL. Uh, some of those databases based on the storage that they're consuming are quite large. Uh, I also know that we've got a fair number of Windows uh, web stacks as well. Quite a bit of .NET running in our environment. And we also have some um, desktop, hosted desktops running in, in this environment as well. So I think we've got a, a wide range of, of applications. I know of at least two or three companies that are using uh, our cloud as development environments. I don't know if that's day-to-day -day development or if those are you know, kind of dev test environments. But um, it is a it's a, it's a fairly broad spectrum of, of applications running here. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, do you uh, do you have any uh, do you have any large database type customers or, or you know, production database uh, type customers in that? Is that a like, is that an environment you that might uh, be more be more more uh, stressful on your current uh, um, uh, storage environment? Yeah, I believe that we do. Again, I don't have real good visibility into what each of the virtual machines is running. However, based on some of the storage that's being consumed by some of our customers, I would suspect that they are running large database environments, multi-terabyte um, databases, as they, you know, that's how much storage they're consuming. And, and how uh, do you have any issues uh, with uh, noisy neighbors? How do you separate out uh, any noisy neighbors or identify them, uh, well, or just so they could not cause a problem? We have uh, one of the advantages of using the VMware technology is that the noisy neighbor problem is um, minimized and handled automatically uh, using the the um, orchestration piece that VMware has. Um, they they will automatically migrate either the noisy neighbor away or the neighbors away onto a separate compute node. And that's, that's pretty much handled automatically for us. We have enough capacity that um, you know, we're not operating at, at full capacity. I think we, we try to keep our, our capacity well below 80% so that we've got enough, uh, enough compute to, to uh, be able to isolate those noisy neighbors when possible. And in fact, that's, you know, I've, I've gotten, you know, several of our customers have come to us simply because they had noisy neighbor problems in a previous cloud provider and, and needed that, that assurance. And uh, since they've been here, we've, we've been able to eliminate that problem for them. Excellent. Thank you. Steve, I'm wondering, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that you've got a lot of your uh, public cloud environment on VMware. You've got some customers that are using Microsoft environments. Um, can you just uh, tell us from your perspective what's your, what's your look at things like Hyper-V, uh, Microsoft Azure, and OpenStack? How do they play into what you're doing and what your customers are asking for? Thank you. OpenStack is a, is a big part of, of what we're doing. We have uh, created some private clouds for customers. Uh, using OpenStack, those private clouds are, are hosted uh, both in our data center and at the customer's uh, location. Uh, I can see OpenStack becoming a more more integral part of our of our environment as we go forward. Uh, we do also have Hyper-V running in some in some areas. Uh, we have not spent as much time in that simply because, again. Uh, the VMware and the OpenStack solutions are sufficient for our needs. We are, however, very, um, very pragmatic. Uh, so if it becomes very evident that Azure and or Hyper-V are, are required for us to do a good job for our customers, we'll certainly implement that. Uh, but to this date, uh, VMware and OpenStack have, have met all the needs that we've had. Great. And, and we do have customers, however, let me, let me just say, we do have customers that I know are running um, Hyper-V in uh, virtual machines in our VMware cloud. 
and okay. ready to pick up the truck. Great. And there, uh, um, oh. sorry, sounds like there's a question on the phone. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Scott Lowe. I've got a question about um, some of the friction points you might be seeing from people as they consider moving some of their infrastructure into the cloud. What are some of the concerns that you're getting from CIOs? Are you getting any, uh, what kind of the business problems are they trying to solve um, as they move uh, to Hunami? Well, you know, we have a lot of customers who are coming to us now that currently have two, three, four racks of, of gear, uh, and in some cases it's aging. Uh, and they don't want to continue to support that and they're wondering. I think the biggest question that we have or the biggest concern we have as people are coming to the cloud is, is simply um, lack of understanding and, and um, lack of experience with the cloud. A lot of the, the people that are coming to us, their, their cloud experience is limited to, to small instances in Amazon or in some cases to um, burgeoning instances in Amazon where they, they started small in Amazon and it's grown nearly out of control and you know, their cost has just gone through the roof. So, so I think the two major concerns we have with, with people moving to our cloud are number one, will it perform the way my existing infrastructure does and can I, can I get away from managing the, the multiple racks of, of data, of, uh, of equipment that I have and then number two, um, how can I control my cost uh, moving to the cloud? And so one of the things that I think that, that our offering gives those people is that with the, with the VMware environment that we have installed, we give you um, full access to your environment. So you can create, you can control the, the, the number of virtual machines that you're running and the, the networking between them. Uh, which gives gives uh, gives a lot more control over that. The other thing I think that um, that we're trying to address is just simply the, the lack of understanding of the cloud. Um, too often uh, we're we're still viewing the cloud I think as if it were a traditional rack of servers, and I think as we understand the virtual environment a little bit better and the flexibility that it, it allows us. I think we'll start seeing more and more applications that are that are architected to take advantage of that, rather than architected in the traditional end tier, um, you know, environment. Uh, and we'll we'll start to see you know elastic, not just elastic cloud. Can you uh, can you add some detail to that, Steve? I mean. Um, you know, this this uh, uh, we've often said on the cube at Silicon Angle Wikibon, we feel like we're entering this new wave of of cloud adoption. The first wave was sort of, you know, the test and dev experimentation, and then the, when the economy turned down, 2008 2009, there was a big push to transfer capex to variable expense, and then coming out of the recession, there seemed to be a lot of line of business movement to the cloud, and now it seems like. CIOs are increasingly embracing the cloud. We, have, we know a number of folks within the Wikibon community, particularly in mid-sized companies that are really getting aggressive about the cloud, but specifically not doing a my mess for less, doing, trying to transform their business and, and do a deeper business integration. Can you talk about how, if that's a reality yet, and are people, I mean, you sort of touched on it just now, but are yeah, people actually it's going deeper? A reality. Yeah, it's becoming a reality, I think, uh, but, but I think, it's going to require a little bit of a paradigm shift for us. We're still, excuse me, I, th I think we're still locked into the, you know, the lamp stack mentality where we've got, you know, Apache up front and we've got MySQL in the back and and PHP or something else in between to, to manage that. But these monolithic apps are just not really what the cloud is all about. We need to start building a little bit more modular applications. Uh, it's going, require, uh, it's going to require somebody at each organization to spend a little time and understand the business and, and understand how you can break that into smaller app servers. The advantage of that then is that I can, I can script the expansion and contraction of my cloud resources based on demand. And that demand can either be um, compute. I have a, a job that I've got to run that, that requires more compute resources, so I need to expand that. Or it could be load. Uh, you know, I've got um, more customers hitting my, my site, so I need to spin up more, uh, you know, Apache front ends or whatever it may be. 
uh, right now most of that is done fairly statically, and I think we can we can we can do a lot better job managing those resources if we spend a little time on that. So you're kind of proposing a flattening of the the cloud stack of a, the cloud pancake and a, a scale out model. Is that am I getting that right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think you know it's. A, it's hard to believe, as far as we've come in the last 20 years with technology, it's hard to remember that I think we're still in the infancy of many, you know, of much of the technology. And I don't know that we've, we've explored all the possibilities that are there. Um, you know, I think if we if we start if we get away from the, the monolithic app and move over into you know more actor based potentially or, uh, you know, very small modules. I think we can expand it, and and the cloud is perfectly positioned to allow us to do that. If if you can, if you can define your networking, if you can define your storage, if you can define your compute all within from code, that gives you a lot more flexibility than we ever had in the past, where you know each of those required a, a network engineer to to deal with or a storage engineer to modify. If I can do it from within my code, I've got a lot more a lot more power. What if we talk a little bit more about performance too? You were mentioning performance before. How do you measure performance? I mean, is it an IOPS? Is it a is it a latency measurement? We talk about that a little bit. We typically um, take a look at IOPS, um, and that seems to be the the method that that is most critical to us. Latency, um, again, as we've gone to this hybrid storage, latency is kind of kind of gone away. Haven't really had to worry about that anymore. Um, the IOPS um, again have have it continued to increase. And so, can you quantify that at all? I mean, what kind of levels are you seeing? I mean, you're in the hundreds of thousands. I mean, can you put any metrics around that? Yeah, we do. I don't have them on my fingertips. I was I had scheduled my storage engineer engineer to be here with me today, but unfortunately he had some emergencies last night, and is just now going to bed. So yeah, oh, sorry to hear that. No, yeah, no worries. I mean, I, David Floyer was pressing you before about uh, you know database activity, where presumably David latency would be more of interest, and Dan was sort of asking questions as well. I don't know, David Floyer, you, if you're still on, I wonder if you could sort of clarify what you're seeing with regard to some of the different. You know performance metrics. I mean, it's interesting to hear Steve talk about. You know, IOPS is really the main metric. Uh, you hear other customers talk about latency is the real issue. Can you maybe help us squint through that dissonance? Sure, I can give um, uh, my perspective on on some of the different areas that we're seeing. Um, I think the opportunity of Flash is to separate out uh, IOPS and and um, and capacity from each other. And obviously IOPS and bandwidth are connected. Um, so that you can charge separately for the, on those two dimensions. And that's happening in a number of places. Uh, and that, that adds a great deal of flexibility because on the same infrastructure you can provide, uh, you can provide low cost, low IOPS uh, for capacity and also high cost, high IOPS. IOPS as well. Um, latency is is very much an issue for large databases, um, and lower latency, getting it below a millisecond, can enormously increase the throughput through uh, through systems, uh, particularly large databases. And that was the, one of the reasons for asking, you know, about your database environment. And uh, obviously, to some extent, that's hidden from you. Um, but the large databases uh, uh, do very well, not only with low latency, but very consistent latency. Um, it's avoiding the occasional 200 millisecond uh, response time that you can get in a, in a disk environment, um, avoiding those and avoiding the timeouts that occur uh, on a whole sequence of, for example, locks. Okay. Um, so w we think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in, in cloud service to, to uh, offer a more modular type of approach. I don't know, is that something you're looking for? Well, and, and yet, I wanted to just ask uh, Steve, I mean, it seems like the Venami model is really simple. Look, this is the level of service that you're getting, it's the default service, it's a, it's a, you call it gold, 
the gold level. Um, it's, it's more performance than you're ever going to need uh, for your class of customer. Um, is that, am I we're getting that right, uh, that, that yeah. that's the market that you're going after, that sort of sweet spot in the middle? Right, and that's exactly right. And one of the things that, that we've found is that um, it, you know, before, before we had the hybrid storage in place, we, we dealt a lot with storage and dealt a lot with the performance of the storage, both latency and IOPS. Since we've installed the hybrid storage, we haven't had to deal with those issues. So, as as, um, as we talked about a minute ago, you know the the hybrid, the flash really does give you give you both the the latency and the um, the the guarantee of low latency uh, combined with with the high IOPS. So. Um, I suspect if we were to have a customer who needed you know, who had a very large database and needed some some um, guarantees there, we would probably structure that a little differently than just our standard cloud offering. We put some other guarantees around it, some other metrics and some other measurements around it to ensure the performance was there. But as you mentioned, our, our current customer base is kind of that middle of the road. Uh, you know, I need what I need and I need it as fast as I can get it and and, what they're getting now is faster than they were getting before, and certainly faster than what they're getting elsewhere, and, and they're very happy. So, Steve, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we can talk a little bit about just when it was TGIL that you ended up choosing. Uh, my understanding is you looked at a number of companies, both some of the big guys and some of the startups that were doing Flash, um, and it was some of the, t tell us kind of why TGIL status really made the cut and some of the other ones didn't stack up against the feature functionality that you had before. Right, so what it really boiled down to is um, a couple of things. Number one, we needed the, the capacity. Uh, we needed to have uh, at least 20 terabytes of usable storage is, is kind of what we were shooting for. We needed the performance, the IOPS, uh, but we also needed the multiple protocol support. We offer a lot of NFS storage. We offer iSCSI, um, and those were those were critical to us. We needed the uh, visibility into the infrastructure from a management standpoint, so that we could manage our SAN and manage the, you know, the performance and, and the load and, and all those things. One of the things that we found as we looked at each of the vendors is single one of them could give us what we needed, uh, but none, none of them could give us everything we needed in a way that we wanted it. Uh, for example, some of the other hybrid storage uh, offerings are exclusively iSCSI. So if we wanted to offer NFS, their solution was that we would spin up a, a Linux VM, mount the iSCSI, and then run NFS from there and offer it out, which just seemed to be uh, more than we wanted to deal with. Others would offer um, the protocols, but charge us for it. So it would be an additional charge. When we got to Tejal, we found that um, we had iSCSI and NFS support uh, included in the in the base offering. Uh, their their portal, their their uh, management portal, gives us all the visibility into the system that we could that we could ever need, and gives us you know the ability to monitor load and performance and, and, and capacity, we can do capacity planning, all that stuff. It's integrated with VMware, uh, so it, um, you know, the, the storage drivers are integrated uh, with, with the VMware environment as well. And we were able to get uh, the capacity that we needed, and it ended up coming in, you know, half or a third of the cost of the comparable offering from our, our previous vendor. And we had the advantage of having the hybrid as well. So how do you, how do you see this shaking out? So you've seen, um, just talk about the, the players and, and the market a little bit. You get innovators like uh, Tegile and others coming out with, you got all flash array guys, you got some hybrid folks. Um, and you got the big guys now entering the market. Um, you saw EMC big announcement this year. Obviously, NetApp is, is get it, trying, trying to get its act together in, in Flash and has made a number of announcements. So how do you see that shaking out? I mean, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, and I know it's just your opinion, but uh, in terms of the little guy's ability to stay ahead 
of the big whales that are now coming into the market. As a buyer, how do you look at that? And how do you, you know, because to, to buy from a smaller company, obviously it's riskier, so they've got to be better. So clearly you, you saw a better value proposition. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and maybe, you know, speculate on what you think, you know, the market's going to look like a couple of years from now. Are the big guys just going to gobble up the little guys or can the little guys keep moving fast? Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we obviously invest. And, and I think the reason for that is, is, well, there's actually a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, the, the big guys, they know how to offer stores. They've been doing it for years, and they've got a well-established architecture. Unfortunately, sometimes I think that can be a hindrance, as we all know. Uh, sometimes moving from an existing architecture that has a great deal of market share is difficult if you want to move to a, to a new architecture, uh, especially one that's disruptive. I think that the, some of these smaller startups um, are able to take advantage, you know, build on the shoulders of giants, if you will, take advantage of the, the strides that the NetApps and the EMCs and the, you know, the other players, the, the three pars, you know, the, the, the architectural um, strides that they have made and, and, and can take a look at that and say, hey, we can build on that and offer um, a more economical solution. I'm not sure that, um, that well, I, I don't believe the EMCs and the NetApps of the world are, are going away anytime soon. I think they will adapt and adjust, and, and I would suspect that um, in five years they'll still be probably still owning the lion's share of the market space. However, I see the Tegiles of the world coming in and taking significant chunks out of that market share, and I think that will continue to, to grow and to change. I think that the, the hybrid storage space is enough of an architectural shift that, that it's going to be difficult for the, the legacy players to jump in quickly. I also think that um, these, these smaller guys are nimble enough and and agile enough that they can make changes and improvements going forward and can be aggressive enough in their pricing that it makes it attractive to, to bring it in. I, I know that there are a lot of people that we've talked to since we've adopted Tegile that are doing the same thing we are. They're an existing net app or, or an EMC shop and are bringing a Tegile in alongside of, not to, re to supplement, augment their existing storage a kind of a, a tire kicking exercise in some cases, I think. Uh, but um, as we found, and I think others will find as well, that the Tejal and others like that offer enough of a price performance um, advantage that it's um, you know it's pretty compelling. Okay, so, so Steve, I think five years from now, as we as we prepare to upgrade our, this system, you know, in five years, two years, whatever it is, when we need to upgrade, I suspect we'll continue the hybrid storage line until we get to a point where where flash is um, is cheap enough that we can afford to do all flash. Okay, Steve, I want to open it up for uh, anybody else on the phone to ask some questions as we're getting close closer to the top of the hour. So uh, anybody, if you have a question, please speak now. Yes, it's, <clears throat> yes, it's Josh Kusher. Hi, Josh. Hi. Two remarks. One remark, the last decade is uh, characterized that the innovation is coming from small companies. And these companies most likely are purchased by the large ones. Like uh, if you have many examples, Compelent by Dell, XIV, uh, Storvitz uh, by IBM, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of these companies manage. In fact, NetApp was also start up something like 12 years ago, and it, this is the only company that grew from start up to be large company. But uh, as I said, the innovation today is coming from uh, from small companies. And most of the cases, they are purchased by large, large companies. Now, the second one, uh, I listen to the performance. And there is a confusion, because per, if you look at the disk, there is a performance, which is latency. And there is throughput, which is IO per second. 
and the IO per second is the maximum the, uh, the number of IOs that can be can be executed before the contract goes in saturation. So both of them are important. And the question is, what do you need? Because if a customer needs large throughput, for example, for for uh, uh, <coughs> the question is, what is the latency that he needs with the large throughput? And you have the, the the graph of the performance is like a golf. So it's normally more or less flat until it goes to saturation. And the flat is the latency time. The second performance measurement, and this is for transaction processing. The second uh, measurement is for sequential operation. And sequential operations are measured, measured by throughput. How, how many megabytes, gigabytes per second the control unit can transfer. So, uh, the, unfortunately, there's a mixture uh, with performance, and in fact, it should be throughput and not performance. So, a couple, two points there, Josh. One on innovation, and you and I have talked about this a lot, and I, I wonder if I, I could have a follow-up, and then the performance discussion. I think you're right. It's a, it sort of depends on your workload, and it's a balance. But I, I want to first ask you about the innovation comment. And you and I have, you know, jostled about this, debated, et cetera, et cetera about, I mean, you flat out made the statement that large companies do, don't innovate, um, they, they, they purchase. But to that point, uh, and I'm, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you've been pretty outspoken about that. But to that point, you've got large companies like, e I mean, EMC just did a $5 billion, you know, debt offering. It's got $17 billion in cash between its three federated companies. You've got Oracle. Uh, IBM, HP paying down its debt and eventually will become an acquirer again. So what do you see as far as these companies, you know, maybe they can't do the organic innovation, but w what's wrong with that? If their internal R&D is for adding features and functions to existing products to essentially keep customer, existing customers happy and they write checks instead of code to innovate, w w what, what's, the, what's wrong with that model? Does it just create too many stovepipes, too much inconsistencies, you know, lack of integration? Or, or is that a viable model now going forward? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, the thing is that I don't say that the large companies are not in innovating, but they're innovating much less than the small companies. Yep. And normally they are improving. There are a lot of features which are requested, for example, for, for development of, of, of those control units. So there's constant development. But if you think about ideas, let's Let's talk, for example, about the real-time compression, which is Storvitz. It is a company which started uh, in Israel. It was a unique company, and they have several PhDs, and uh, the idea came from them. If you think about the duplication, for example, nobody spoke about the duplication until 2004, 2005. And then suddenly you have companies, some of them were new companies, like Diligent, which is which was purchased by IBM, or mm -hmm. uh, Data Domain, which was purchased by EMC, and uh, there was Avamar, which was purchased by EMC, and et cetera, et cetera. The innova innovation or startup are people which are normally hungry people which work enormously to, because if they will succeed, the reward is very, very high. The people in established company, large companies, they are getting salary. They, if, if they will invent something, they may get a bonus, <laughs> but they will never be a millionaire. You get an attaboy. I know, <laughs> yeah. I know many millionaires which were from startups, very simple. I have people who made four, who started four startups, selling each one of them to large companies. Is that answer? Uh, answer yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, so I ju just want to, as we're getting I've close got, to the top of the I'm hour. This is David. I've, Go, thanks, I've David. Got just one question, if I may, from Steve. Um, how do you, uh, what's the difference uh, with the Tegile in terms of the 
thought that you need to give it. You've mentioned several times you don't need to uh, spend as much time on that. Could you could you put some numbers around how that's uh, come down, and, and how have you integrated that into your orchestration? Has that been an easy thing to do? It has been easy. What we what we basically have done, and again, most of most of the storage is consumed by our public cloud, and so we are able to do all of, all of the provisioning that is done either um, in an automated fashion or you know, when, the, when the customer chooses to, to increase or, or create storage. Um, in terms of, of support, uh, the real issue that we found in the past was we spent an awful lot of time, of, and I suspect it was mostly because of uh, because our capacity, we were nearing capacity, so we spent a lot of time juggling storage, making sure that it was available. Now that we have more storage, that's not an issue anymore, uh, number one. Uh, number two, we also spent a lot of time in the past balancing the latency and the IOPS for our customers. Um, from our standpoint, the workload is very mixed. We don't have any control over it because it's, you know, it's our cloud. Uh, and, and we don't have any control over the individual workloads, so we would have to kind of play that that balancing act between between latency and IOPS in the past, uh, because the Tejal system is so performant both from a latency standpoint and an IOPS standpoint. <clears throat> we don't spend any time worried about it anymore. It just performs. Uh, but, yeah, so. how, how much time did you suspend? Is that a you know? A, a, you had to dedicate to that, or what, what sort of size well, uh, problem? We had we have an engineer who's who's among other things tasked as our storage engineer. Um, I suspect in the past he was spending close to thirty to forty percent of his time uh, dealing with storage related issues. Uh, since we've got the Tejal installed, uh, I think that's dropped down to about five percent of his time. All right. Thanks very much. And those are slides. I know they'll tell me I'm completely Sounds like there's another question on the phone there. Hold on, Steve. <clears throat> yeah, this is um, Scott Lowe again. I have a question about um, your remote replication agreement with, with Tejal. Can you tell me a little bit about how that's working out and um, if, if people are taking advantage of that? Thank you. I had forgotten about that. You know, one of the things that, that um, purchasing the Tejal did for us is give us, give us that opportunity. We have a Tejal SAN in both of our locations. One of the things that uh, Tejal builds in is, is replication capability. And uh, because of the way they do their technology, all of that data that's replicated is deduped data as well. So we're able to take full advantage of that. We have entered into a partnership with Tejal to offer offsite replication to their customers. So we have some of their, several of their customers now, and it's, it's only been the last, um, I think, six weeks or so that we've, we've actually productized that. So we're just kind of in the initial ramp up stage of that. But it, it really makes a very, a, a compelling offering for Tejal uh, as they go into to some of these um, local data centers and you know customers to be able to offer. A, a, you know, a two terabyte replication or a, a you know, five terabyte replication to our data center. And then we can, you know, we can offer uh, multiple add-on solutions for that as well. So we can, you know, we can encrypt that. If, if, if that um, connection needs to be encrypted, we can create an IPsec tunnel between, between locations. We can do um, anything from, you know, just a cold standby to, to full, you know, full DR solution as well. So if in one instance one of the customers is, is running a VMware environment and so the payload that's getting replicated to our data center are virtual machines. In the event that you know of a catastrophe, if they need to, we can stand those virtual machines up in our in our cloud environment very, very quickly. Uh, and um, you know they can be back up and running within a matter of hours as opposed to days or weeks. that come close to answering the question? Yeah, do you have people right now that are taking advantage of that service that maybe, maybe have their own Tejal units and they want to 
use you guys as sort of a DR opportunity? We do, we do actually, yeah. We have, uh, we are consuming um, several different replication points. So, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been a, a huge win for us as well. Thanks. Great. David, did you have a follow up there or? Okay, uh, Steve, I, I've got one final question for you. Uh, is you know you went through you know a significant change from an old architecture to a new architecture. What advice would you give to kind of your, your peers, to uh, companies that are kind of deciding to go internal or uh, to, to cloud environments, or just you know looking at those architectural changes from you know disk to something like a flash environment? Uh, what what have you learned? Uh, what would you do a little bit differently? What advice would you give to your peers? Well, you know, selfishly, I'd say just call Unami and we'll take care of it for you. <laughs> uh, but realistically, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues that you need to take advantage of, and and nobody knows your environment as well as you do, and so you need to make sure that you understand that. One of the things that we we found as we were going through our storage uh, uh, review uh, was that uh, in a couple of cases, the vendor was trying to tell us how our environment worked. Uh, and that didn't really fly very well with us. We know it very well. So make sure that you understand your environment. Make sure you know what your pain points are. Make sure that that you're evaluating apples to apples. Um, too often we get, uh, you know, we get caught up in IOPS or in latency or, or you know, whatever it may be, or you know, it's flash. Or you know, as technologists, we. I think sometimes we get too excited about shiny and less excited about what really, really is the solution. So, so I think, I think, I think if, as we're going through, as we're going through these process, make sure you understand what your problem is, first of all, and make sure you're solving the right problem. Secondly, make sure you understand the technology that you're planning to migrate to so that you can take advantage of it. Don't, uh, in terms of the cloud, don't treat the, uh, the cloud as if it were just another rack. Use it as, a, as it's designed. Uh, make sure you take advantage of all the, the um, possibilities that are there, even if it means spend a little bit of time in re-architecting. So I think those are probably the two keys that, that, I, would, that I would suggest. All right. Steve, thank you so much for uh, sharing your feedback here with the community. Uh, we're we're going to go into wrap-up mode now, so a reminder to everyone uh, that uh, the recording of this uh, video, the audio podcast, as well as you know, new research uh, covering lots of different angles from the technology, the CIO, the vendor community, organizational actions, will be up on wikibon.org, usually within 48 hours, definitely within the next week. So we recommend that you go to wikibon.org, uh, check out the content. If you have content that you want to add to it, feel free to add comments, hit edit, uh, participate in the communication. Uh, video will be up on youtube.com slash silicon angle. Uh, you're also going to be able to find lots more on cloud. If you follow the cube, which is on Twitter, just the cube and siliconangle.com, uh, a lot of big cloud shows coming up. At the end of August, there will be VMworld. In September, you've got Oracle Open World. And then a little bit later in the world, Amazon reInvent. Expect to see lots of coverage from us at all of those events and many more. So uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you to Steve Newell from Vunami. Of course, if you go to Vunami.com or Vunami on Twitter, you can find out lots of them. We really appreciate them uh, participating and sharing with their peers what they're doing uh, on there. Uh, you, you can also, um, you know, you know, contact us. Uh, my name is Stu Miniman. I'm at Stu on Twitter. This was Dee Vellante here with me. I want to thank the people on the call that participated. Dan from Morgan Stanley, uh, Josh, uh, David Floyer, Scott Lowe. Uh, and uh, I, I think I got everybody there. So uh, this is Stu Miniman wrapping up with today's Peer Insight, Enhancing Cloud Services with Hybrid Storage for July 30th, 2013. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, and we will see you next time. Thanks.